<laughs> it's quiet here. It's Saturday night. Everybody else is out partying, and there's just me, uh, an iMac, a microphone, and so of course this is the Mastering Portrait Photography podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon I could do it, you know. I reckon I could be a late night DJ. And this tune, this next tune goes out to Charlie, who's heading up the M1 back to be home with his family after three long days away. Safe journeys, Charlie, and enjoy this next tune. It's just for you. Of course, <laughs> it's not. I couldn't be. Uh, but I sometimes wonder whether me sitting here, it is late at night. I do have a microphone. Uh, I do think I could... Um, probably come up with the same banal conversations if if i'm not already but about uh you know general life rather than as i do uh, about photography it has been quite a week and there's a podcast in the making actually from this week uh, at some point i need to sit and record it properly um because in the eight days so not seven days but eight days this week i had six different client jobs with completely different clients that could all be traced back to a relationship with just uh, one guy, a guy I met about eight years ago when I was working at the Hearing Dogs and we've continued to be friends, even though he has now moved on through several different companies, each of which I've retained as clients as he's moved on. I've stayed with them uh, and equally as he's moved on, he's taken me with him. So uh, it's been a brilliant week. I've spent quite a bit of time um, with this one particular client and I think I'll turn that uh, into a podcast all of its own because I think it might be quite useful. Uh, spent this afternoon or today rather, we've had uh, one early morning shoot, which I could have done without, but it had to be done. And then two really lovely family shoots. It was, uh, it's been really, really beautiful today. The sun has shone. The kids have been great. Uh, the families have been wonderful. And we've created, I hope, some images that people really, really enjoy. Because, of course, that is your job, is to give people an experience. They really enjoy it. They come back and they want to remember that experience uh, by buying pictures. However, that's not really what this podcast is about. This podcast uh, features an incredible guy, a guy called Terry Hope. Now, Terry Hope uh, is the long-standing editor of Professional Photo Magazine. Um, now, it's now being independently published by Terry, uh, so it makes him a bit of a newbie publisher. Uh, he has bought the uh, magazine just a few short weeks ago, and so he is going to be not only... Be, he's not only going to edit it, but he's going to be the owner of it, which puts him in a very interesting position. Uh, it says here on my on the bio notes that I have for him, he trained as a photographer, uh, but went straight into journal, journalism and has worked on various titles, including Camera Weekly, Amateur Photographer and Professional Photographer, all of which, of course, as a photographer, I have bought, consumed some of which I've kept. I have big piles of them. <laughs> when we get to the end of a big pile of mags, uh, rather than bin them, we usually donate them to the local photography college where they probably bin them. I like to think they actually get read or cut up or something, but I hate throwing away paper. And I love magazines. I think it's a great format. There's something still uh, incredibly visceral when you pick up photographs that have been printed, whether they're in a frame, whether they're on a fine art print, or in this case, uh, whether they're in um, magazines. And so it says here he was part of the team that launched Bright Publishing and was the launch editor of Digital Photo Pro, uh, which eventually morphed into Professional Photo a few years back. Uh, and as the new owner, he's looking to do all sorts of exciting things. So uh, I think the first edition that we're involved in uh, comes out as edition 159. If I say I think I know that because I've seen uh, the proofs and things. Uh, so we're going to be featured in the magazine for the next year or so, uh, writing a series of columns on uh, lighting, different lighting patterns, how to deal with certain lighting situations, whether it's hard light outside, which is what the first episode is about, or whether it's creating really soft, subtle uh, lighting in your studio. Uh, so this interview is with Terry. He's a great guy. And of course, as usual, I ask him just to give me a quick overview of who he is and what he is about. Enjoy. Right, okay. Uh, my name is uh, Terry Hope. Um, I'm the um, fresh publisher of Professional Photo Magazine. Um, have been the editor of it and the launch editor for um, 13 years. And prior to that, I was uh, editor of Professional Photographer at um, Archant Publishing yeah. House. Uh, I, left, um, I left that company with a, a team of people 13 years to go to help set up Bright Publishing. Right which is based near Cambridge and Sawston. And um, so Professional Photo Magazine started out as Digital Photo Pro, became Photo Pro and then Professional Photo. I was also editor of um, Pro Movie Maker at yeah. Bright. Um, so the opportunity arose 
quite recently, literally within the last month or so, to acquire Professional Photo Magazine. And uh, it was one of those opportunities that comes along. And, and I think if you don't take it, you probably would regret it. Yeah. Um, because um, it's one of those things, it's, it's both um, exhilarating and exciting and terrifying yeah. all at the same time. Because the learning curve is something akin to climbing Everest. There's so many things I don't know about publishing a magazine, which I'm learning and having to learn very quickly. But it's all good and it's all interesting and it's a blank canvas and I'm, I'm really looking forward to taking it on. <laughs> you could, you're saying that now because we've timed this interview perfectly to be just after you delivered issue, I'm going to call it issue one. Issue one for me, issue 159 In, for the one magazine. Five, that's just gone to the print stands, hasn't it? That's just gone Last off to print. Last Friday, yes. And... Um, what also didn't help especially is that with, with these kind of things, even though I was um, acquiring the magazine from people I knew and from Bright Publishing and we have a very good, very amicable relationship, you still have to go through the legal process and obviously until you, you, you sign the forms and you actually physically own the magazine, you can't really go and talk to the industry about it because um, it's, it's under wraps. and. Uh, and so really I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say anything to anybody until I was a week into the schedule and when you think it's a four week schedule that was quite a chunk of time that had already gone by the time I got my hands on it. So I then had three weeks of intense work which included kind of weekends and 12 hour days and everything else to kind of pull that first issue together. But it did in fact go last Friday which uh, was a blessed relief, fell over, had a weekend and now I'm starting again. <laughs> On issue 160, which, um, yes, I've actually got four weeks on that. Well, it's so. perpetual, isn't it? Because you'll, you'll now be working yes. on issue 160 and 161 and 162. Yes. They start to creep into your radar. It's forever, and yes. you've, and, But you've been an editor for a long time. I have, yes. I, uh, I, I was an editor, but I worked on a magazine called Camera Weekly right, yep. uh, at Haymarket Publishing. And then um, that was sold to IPC who published Amateur Photographer and they, they shut down Camera Weekly. So I then went to work on Amateur Photographer after a year or so of freelancing. I became features editor and then deputy editor there. And um, that involved a move to London and um, that was working at King's Reach Tower uh, in the next office to Loaded Magazine actually, which was <laughs> really good fun. And the office next to them was New Musical Express, right. which was great. You, you, you've talked yourself about being in a band. Well, I was in a band as well. And um, it's friends in high places, what would happen on New Musical Express if uh, they got to press day and they had any space they hadn't sold advertising into, they'd come through and say, what gig is your band playing? And I'd tell them, and one week we had a bigger ad than U2's European <laughs> tour, and, um, which probably would have cost about 10 grand or something. And it, we were playing at the Dog and Duck in there, the Elephant and Castle. Yeah. And uh, so everyone wondered who this band was that kept appearing. But, it was great, and I used, to, um, I used to write stories for Loaded and so on, so great experience. And then um, I decided to leave there eventually and go freelance again. And um, I then became editor of something called um, BPI News, which is an industry magazine that goes out to shops, but as a freelance job for Archant. Right. Um, but they also published Professional Photographer, and after a while that, that position came up as editor of that as well. So I edited both of them, but as a freelancer. So I was probably there for about, I suppose, two or three years editing that magazine. And, and it was good. We had a very good team on it. And um, we did very, very well with it. And um, the circulation pretty much doubled in that time. And we had a formula with it that involved a lot of um, talking about marketing and, and, and bringing in more interviews with people who were sort of um, uh, working on the rock face of, of being professional photographers. And so changed it around a bit, made it a bit less dry and a bit more, a bit more kind of commercial and, and approachable. Um, and then we, we thought to ourselves that actually this was something we felt as a team, we're a very good team and, and we had all the bases covered, that we potentially could do this ourselves. And so we, um, we eventually took the plunge and, and set up our own publishing house between us, uh, which was Bright Publishing. Uh, and that was 13 years ago. So uh, as I say, professional photo as now started off as Digital Photo Pro uh, for a few years and then became Photo Pro. We lost the uh, the digital bit because at that time, obviously digital was, was the key word and, and it was moving from film to digital. So that was quite a, 
an important word. As it became less important, it wasn't needed. Uh, and then eventually that turned into professional photo. So that was probably about three or four years ago. And um, it's always been a monthly. Um, I've pretty much always worked on it. Although I did kind of go off at a tangent and, and, and edit um, Pro Movie Maker, which was... Um, the difference with that was that was a filmmaking magazine that was different to the other ones out there because it was photographers moving into filmmaking yeah. or taking on filmmaking as part of what they did. Yeah. And uh, that, was, that was really interesting for me as well because so many photographers, they, they take stills and then because it's now become so accessible to make films, obviously the 5D Mark II, the Canon 5D Mark II started that. And so many people kind of switched over to um, the video button on their 5D Mark II and realized they could make really good quality full frame films. It was never designed to be a filmmaker's camera, but they used every kind of shortcut possible and all kinds of cunning devices to turn it into a filmmaking camera. And, and that kind of opened the door to accessible filmmaking and that made it of interest to professional photographers. But I've always felt that um, myself, if I'm gonna write about something, I have to, I can't write about something I'm not interested in. And um, I personally found filmmaking really interesting as a kind of a, something to explore as a photographer. And um, so I, I did a lot of that myself. And um, basically I, I made the same journey as the readers of the magazine were making. So it was never highly technical because I couldn't make it highly technical because half the time I didn't know what I was talking about. But I got people in who did, as, as you do as a journalist, um, you, you get people in to talk about what they're doing. And, and of course, by writing those stories, I learned myself. And, um, but I've always been a freelancer, even for Bright. I've, I've never been uh, a staff person. And uh, so I'd be doing freelance jobs alongside the editing job. And, and I've started to make films and work with filmmakers. And uh, because I think if, if you're gonna write about it, you've gotta do it. And, um, and so I'd, I'd, I'd come up against the same issues that people who were reading the magazine would come up against and the questions they would ask. And it would also mean I'd understand the people I was interviewing because I'd be on the same level and, and we'd be using the same kit. And of course, I had the, um, the bonus that I, I get to test all the cutting edge stuff. So if um, a new camera came out, I'd get it in to test, but I could also make a film with it. And the uh, same with lights and microphones and things. So in a very good position really to try lots of things yeah. out and um, uh, I got interested in drones as well and um, took a drone license because again if I'm going to talk to people who were drone filmmaking and, and taking drone stills uh, it was really useful to know what it was all about and, and to get the license myself and then I was on their level in that I could I could ask some questions that because I had that understanding of having done a bit of it myself and um, it was fascinating except that it, it's a very difficult uh, qualification to get and you do kind of put your head in the noose it's almost like um, if you were to do something uh, which was a series showing you taking a driving test and then fail the driving test at the end you, you look a bit of a an idiot so yeah I realized I kind of got to the point where I had to do the flying test and that had to um, that had to hit the deadline for the issue that it had to go into um, but it also it's about 50 50 whether I get through or not and um, we had to cancel it once because the weather was atrocious. And then the, the second time was the very last opportunity to do it, to hit that deadline. And um, I had to drive down to Bristol to do it. And um, it was a terrible day. And um, I had one of these machines that measures the, the wind speed. And the wind speed at one point was 30 miles an hour, which, um, you know, you just don't fly a drone in that because the, the drone can probably only do about 20 miles an hour so if it's 30 miles an hour in the opposite direction you can imagine you're going to lose it at 10 miles an hour and um, the person before me I think his, his job must have been to make me look good because he completely lost the uh, lost his uh, drone which kind of disappeared off into the far horizon and uh, so then it was my turn because you have to turn off the um, uh, the uh, uh, basically what keeps it there you, 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 you turn you have to fly it manually basically and uh, and uh, and then land it so if you lose the signal basically you can bring it down without crashing or losing it and um, yeah I, I managed to catch it and bring it down and probably if I'd done it 20 times I probably would have 19 times lost it but in that particular time I got it brought it down 
and, and got the license, but was great because then I hit the deadline as well, which was even more important. So, so you're a musician, a yes. writer, a photographer, writer, publisher, editor. Let's put that in there. Um, yes. And if, if I was kind of being gloomy, I'd say those are three industries that have <laughs> yeah. been, broadly speaking, decimated by digital. Uh, yes. Well, you say decimated. I, I think, I actually think digital has been amazing. And, 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 and it was almost the opposite, really, of, of decimated, because when digital technology came in, I mean, particularly with the professional area, because professionals don't have a choice, really. Um, they have to do what's viable and what's commercially uh, going to work for them. And actually, digital was, was fantastic for the magazine because obviously suddenly there's lots to talk about, lots of new technology, and it's suddenly really exciting, really cutting edge, lots of really interesting stuff coming out. I remember how much activity was going on at the time. I'd be sent, uh, I was sent by Olympus a 1300 pound camera that was a 1.3 megapixels. And they sent it to me to review and then rang me up a week later, say, oh, don't bother, we, we've taken that off the shelf and we've got another one now. And you'd have to be incredibly brave to have been in the business at that time investing in digital because kit was incredibly expensive, but it was being superseded within about six months. And so lots and lots and lots for us to talk about and lots of people very eager to learn about what digital was all about. And lots of people saying, well, I'm never going digital. I'm a film photographer. I'm going to stick with my film cameras. And of course, every single one of them has had to move over because you can't be viable against your rivals if, if, they, if they're using digital and you're on film. And, and film is wonderful. I mean, film is amazing. And, and, and if you're um, a hobbyist and you're doing it for the, the sheer joy of it, then, then using a film camera is wonderful. And I, I still shoot a bit of film. But um, if, you're, if you're trying to make a living as a photographer, film's really expensive. Yeah. Um, you have to process it as well. That's another expense. Uh, you probably almost certainly have to digitize it these days to share it and, and send it to the places it needs to go. And there are all sorts of things we film um, about you're, you're working with the original, whether it's a negative or a transparency, and that, that's very dangerous in that uh, if you lose that original or it gets damaged, uh, you might have to send that original off to be published, um, which again is taking it out of your hands. Uh, there obviously was a thriving industry for making uh, copies of originals and they never looked very good. They were never a patch on the quality of the original transparency. So again, that was a problem. So, and, and, and the other thing as well is, of course, it, it helps you to try things out in that you can, you can try things on a digital camera and see immediately what you've got. Whereas previously, you'd have to pop it on a bike and send it to the local pro lab. And even the quickest, it'd be an hour or two before it came back, which would often happen if you're on a commercial job in central London. There'd be any amount of professional labs like Joe's Basement and so on around Soho, 24 hours a day operation. You'd, um, you'd send a film off, uh, you'd do a, a, a test, a strip test on it, and um, you'd find out whether you, you, your film, your picture is coming out properly, and then you could go ahead and do the shoot. Or you'd use Polaroid, and Polaroid pretty much you know, hit the rocks overnight when people no longer needed Polaroid. Um, photographers, professional photographers, must have got through so much Polaroid film, because that was pretty much your only, only way of knowing whether you were anywhere near where you wanted to be. And um, yeah, so digital really transformed the, uh, the commercial area. And um, yeah, so that, that actually was really interesting. And then filmmaking, of course, came off the back of that. And uh, that was something else for us to talk about. So again, that, that, that gave us a, a huge market to explore and to talk about. And that's still growing. So with professional photo now, uh, it's no longer just a magazine that is... Um, it's just talking about stills on the wall, because although that's a big part of the job, um, all kinds of other things come into it. I was, um, you know, I, I, I think for, about, you know, about things like, for example, not just filmmaking, but things like VR and 360 image making. I was talking to a photographer the other day, he was a wedding photographer, and he will shoot um, a 360 degree picture of the, um, of something like the reception or the wedding service. And then um, he'll have bits and pieces of that that you can click into to get videos or sound bites and, and stills. And so everything is self-contained within this one image. It's like almost exploring a, a canvas and, and it's interactive. And 
that's that's what he offers his client that differentiates him from everybody else. Yeah. So he's using technology to offer something different. And I just think it's so interesting. And, and, and we're kind of reflecting ideas. And what we do in the magazine, I think, is to talk to contemporary photographers who are doing doing well, who are running their businesses well. They've got really good marketing and ways of approaching their, their business. And we're, and we're sharing those. We're a community. Um, I think the professional photographic community is... is I love it for a start because I've always been associated with it. I love talking to creative people. Um, I share their enthusiasm with what they're doing. I love the way that it's a creative job and that um, every job is different. Every, well, it should be. Uh, there shouldn't be a formula. It shouldn't be formulaic. You shouldn't just put your lights here and your lights there. Everybody's different. If you've got a different subject coming in to be photographed, you've got to use your wits to get something out of that that person you you have to put them at their ease someone who's not used to being in front of the camera you've got to talk to them and get something out of it that, that nobody else could get and you get something original that that can't be repeated um from that session and i love all of that i love i love being involved in the creative industry and i, I admire and respect photographers in every genre but i i i do think it, it it's just so interesting as well that everybody well most people not everybody but most people are self-employed so they have to kind of run a business as well. There's very, very few jobs for photographers. Um, you don't have a nine to five go and work um, down the high street as a photographer. You normally, you have to run a business. So you have to have all the other things at your disposal to be able to make a living, to be successful. And um, creative people often don't have that in their locker. They're, they can be incredibly good at interpreting a scene and, and getting an image out of the other end but to run a business as as anybody who is in in the uh, in the industry knows it's, it's really difficult you you're suddenly talking about you know you might potentially have to have a, a studio that you have to pay for you you have to work out how to bring business in you have to know what to charge you have to market yourself to people who won't have heard of you um, you have to invest in the right gear you have to make business decisions about what direction you want to go in, uh, what kind of services you want to offer. Um, it, it's suddenly lots of things that if you're good at taking pictures, you're not necessarily going to be good at running a business. And, and if you're not, the, the, the potential is to you know, hit a brick wall and to have a, a real problem. So a lot of what professional photo does, we do have technique in there. We, we do lots of things as we've done with yourselves on a, on a, on a lighting technique feature, which is which is brilliant because you have to be able to take great pictures, however good you are as a business operator. But um, what else we'll have in there? We'll have a lot on marketing. Lots of people are very, very successful businesses who will be sharing how they, um, how they market their business, um, particularly how, uh, how they sell online, for example. We, we've got a new series which is starting up, which is about turning your website into a selling machine and, and, and how you do that. And... Um, there's so much to it, so many aspects to it that you have to be in control of. And, and part of the magazine, I've always said what it is, it's not just a photographic magazine, it's a small business magazine. And so you're going to face the same kind of challenges that someone who has a small business, whether they're a, a plumber or a painter decorator or they, they have a delivery business or something. There's so many things that cross over. And um, you have to have all those aspects under control. How, uh, and, and unless you do that, you're not going to have a successful business, and and part of our job is to explain that to people, and to um, and to give them good examples to follow. We we're a proper community, and um, that I think is is one of our strengths that we are a proper community, and and we get people who get a lot out of the magazine. We also get people who want to contribute to it because what I found with photographers over the years is that they're incredibly good at sharing. They really are, and and if you get to something like the um, society's convention every January. You get people there who are standing up and doing talks and networking going on in the bars. And people um, are almost too giving in a way, because in a way, uh, lots of people have got rivals that they're, you know, they're, they're competing against in the high street or in the same, in the same organization, but they're so giving, they're so willing to share their information. I mean, particularly for people coming into the business from new, from fresh. And I can kind of tap into that, the people who are willing to share and, and, and to give things, and not for any kind of personal benefit, because um, they just enjoy sharing and they, they like helping other people. And there is this networking aspect as well, that 
in, in many ways, you shouldn't see other photographers as rivals and people to be scared of. And uh, you, you, the networking side of things, I think, is really good. And um, I've always found that as well, that if you run a business, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm likewise a, a small business because I'm, I am now put my head in the noose and become a small <laughs> publisher. Uh, so I am now very much a small business and facing lots of the challenges that other people who run small businesses face. And, and the, the big thing I miss from not being at Bright already, and I've only been out a few weeks, is not having a team. Yeah. Uh, because um, you'd go into Bright and there'd be people who are specialist uh, journalists who I work with, uh, people who are specialist salespeople, designers, um, uh, subs desk and all the rest of it. And, and people you bounce ideas off and you talk to and you have banter with and, you know, you just basically got people around you. And, and suddenly I haven't. I've worked with lots of freelancers. And so I have a freelance designer and I have, I'm doing a lot of the ad sales myself at the moment and may change that over time. But um, I'm very much working on my own. But I think something like the Society's Convention for Photographers, that's an opportunity and a rare one to actually yeah, rub shoulders with other people in the business, to share ideas, actually get a bit of support. You know, you might have an issue that you're facing that you find another photographer has exactly the same issue. And you talk it through and you can give something back to them and they can give something to you. And uh, you can actually share your experience and um, come out of it at the other end, both having benefited. And I actually know people who run networking events between themselves. So it could be a, a team of photographers maybe that hires a piece of kit that's a new piece of kit and between them they hire it for a weekend they go out hire a model and and try that piece of kit out and between them you know it's a sixth of the cost of hiring the gear and they all get pictures they can put on the websites and things um they have people they can pass work on to if they can't do it and and it comes back the same way so in many ways i mean what we're trying to say within the magazine is that you know you you are a community and you shouldn't be scared about being part of that community and being an active part of that community and sharing. And if you share, it will come back to you. And uh, that, I think, is a really good message to, to put across in the magazine as well. So what were you as a musician? You said musician. You never, you never was, elaborated. Yeah, I was a bass player. Of course you were. And, and, um, and, and it was back in the day when um, you would... Um, it, it was almost... Um, it, it was punk rock and it was almost a kind of kickback against um, the Pink Floyds of the day that, that would kind of have these massive tours where... They wouldn't talk to the audience and you, you'd be miles away. And, and suddenly it changed overnight to being uh, three chord wonders. And <laughs> we actually had a gig in the book before I'd even bought the guitar, let alone learn how to play it. And um, so we had to commit to it. And I had to get up and play and uh, never look back, really. And it was, it was so much fun. I mean, I actually had a, a night out with um, friends the week before last. And, and um, three of the four people there I've been in bands with because you, you tend to be like a band of brothers in a way, you have yeah. to rely on each other so much. And then down the line, um, they're friends for life. And um, when I have uh, big birthdays and things, I get a band back together and get up and uh, lock the doors and nobody gets out alive until uh, <laughs> they've had to put up with a set. So um, yeah, I, I, I love Actually, it. you're a good person to know, because uh, I was a drummer. Mm. I have a vocalist in the oh, industry. Well. We're, so we're, we're, talking about doing, we're talking about doing uh, <laughs> sort of a photography industry band that when yeah. there's the big conventions we could get the band together yes. a bit like the Formula One guys do yes but yeah. only better obviously yes yeah uh, so if you fancy more that cool. well, if you fancy yeah. that uh, you might need to know more than three chords I'd probably learn a fourth one if I okay. put my head down okay because uh, the vocalist is exceptional uh, yes well she's brilliant that's so, that, and, that's she, and she takes no prisoners so if you no. you will have to know your stuff yes yeah, okay. I'm not yeah. divulging who that is at the moment. No. Well, I, I do know someone as well who's massively into ad sales, who, who, whose secret ambition is to be a DJ. And, um, and yes, uh, he would turn up at um, conventions like that and actually spin the discs for them. Oh, okay. You know? So we've, we've got, so we've we've got, got, the, the we've got some things. But on that really. kind of note, mm. you know, you're talking three different creative industries, music, mm. uh, publishing and photography. What do you think sets people apart in those industries that makes them great and long-lived and successful? I, I don't know if a better word to describe it. I, I think you've got a bit of sponge. You've got to, you've got to look at information. You've got to, you don't want to copy people, but you've got to be able to look around and to pick pieces up from around you that you can incorporate and, and put your own spin on it. Yeah. And I think, um, I think you've always got to be... I mean, I'm very fortunate in that I work in a business where my whole essence of what I do is to look at 
um, fresh and interesting photography and, and ways of working. So I'm all the time assimilating things from around me. But I, I think lots of people, you, you can see, I mean, this is why conventions and things are good, which is why reading, it's a bit of an advert, why reading magazines like ours are good, <laughs> because you do, you, you pick up things that other people do. Right? You, you could be doing a certain genre of photography, but somebody else is doing it slightly differently. You might think, well, that's really good, but I could put my spin on that and I could do that slightly differently. And I suppose that, that's the same in the music business yeah. in that, um, you know, you, you listen to other people's music, you don't go out and copy it, but you, you, you might incorporate some of that into your style or, or you know, you, the way you play a guitar or, or a bass riff you have or, or something, or even the kind of style of music you play. So I do think in, in creative business, it, it's, it's, it's very often kind of cherry picking what's around you and putting your spin on it. You've got to be, um, you've got to be a self-starter. You, you've got to get out of bed in the morning. And if, if, you're, um, if you're running a small business, nobody's going to kind of say, well, it's nine o'clock, you know, you should be working by now. And that's very difficult to do as well if there's no work. Yeah. Um, so particularly people who are starting out, they're not going to have any, any kind of work coming in. So what do you do? I mean, you kind of get up on, on the first morning, you're running a business and think, well, I've got nothing to do. And the, the temptation is to turn over and go back to sleep. But of course, you know, paying the mortgage and everything else is, <laughs> is a massive incentive. And, you know, I've had things like a family that's dependent on me to, to earn a living and I can't sit around anyway. So you basically, you have to know how to get out there and, and you have to be very motivated and um, you have to put in the hours that, I mean, any creative business is not nine to five. So you have to be prepared to kind of work the evenings, work the weekends. Uh, you have to kind of get to know people. For example, if you're a photographer, I think it's a brilliant thing to do to go and assist people, even if you're doing it for free, because then you get to see how they work. And I think you should definitely be assisting before you do your own shoot. Do you? Uh, because things go wrong, you know, what, what do you do? I mean, it's all very well if everything goes completely to plan. You know, what do you do if something happens, something goes wrong, or, or you know, uh, something breaks, or, you know, you have to be able to, you have to know how someone who's been in the business for years would handle it, and, and how they handle the people, how they talk to the people, and there's, I, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you know yourself, but it's your kind of interpersonal skills as well, isn't it? It's kind of, if you're awkward with people, you could be a great, uh, you could be a great still life photographer or a landscape. Or so. <laughs> you just, it doesn't mean just you're not you a great your photographer. Own. Yeah, I mean you you would you would do something that suits your skills, but you have to be, you have to be so good with people yeah. if you work with people. Now that's weddings and portraits, and even selling yourself on a on a job. You know, if you go and talk to somebody to try and to try and get the job, uh, you know, for for your business. You've got to be able to talk to people. You've got to be easy to get on with, friendly. Um, there's so much, I mean, particularly on, on the magazine over the years, I've realised lots of advertisers who have a big choice of other magazines they can put their, um, their goods into. And often they'd get just as much feedback on their, on their products in another magazine than they would with ours. But they go with ours because they like us. Yeah. And they like working with us. They like the way we do things. They like the look of the magazines. And there's so much of that as well. You have to be... And you've got to be really into it. You've got to be really interested. You can't fake enthusiasm. You can't. You can't sit there and say, well, you know, I do a magazine. It's, it's a job. Yeah. You know, actually, I, I, I don't really enjoy it. You know, it's yeah. nine to five and I can't wait to retire. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, you, you've got to be fully into it and, and people will sense if you're not. And I'm sure that's the same as a photographer. Oh, if absolutely. You kind of, yeah, you just turn up and, and go through the motions. You need to be yeah. authentic and you need to be enthusiastic. Yeah. Because your energy, mm. it, well, it, it, it reflects off them, <laughs> off your yeah, client. Yeah. Of course you have to be like that. And I've met so many people who say, well, you know, I could hit 50 and I, all my energy's gone, you know, and I, I just can't do it anymore and, uh, you know, and I, I can't, I'll get so tired. And don't understand that. I, well, I, I maybe, uh, maybe, maybe that does happen. I, I, I think if you're enthusiastic about what you do, you never lose your energy. No, I'm 50 and my, the only thing that's yeah. slowing me down is my knees hurt more than they used to. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things. There are some things I used to do really naturally. Yes. I used to drop to the floor mm. and take a picture, and now I drop to the floor, take a picture, and take time getting back up. Yes, it's yeah, not no, quite as no, rapid no, as it rush. used to be. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but yeah, but it's the actual, you know, the actual doing and the energy yeah, yeah. and the enthusiasm. I, I'm more that, enthusiastic that now about it than I ever was. Yeah. Which I think is great. I mean, if you ever lose that, I don't know why you'd ever lose that because there's so much going on. There's so much interesting stuff coming through. I mean, I love VR, for example. Yeah. 
And um, that is fascinating. I'm not quite sure how photographers might use that, but it's for, for the filmmaking magazine, yeah. uh, particularly, that was really interesting. And, and you can see how, and I know people who are doing really well out of that because they're leading, they're on the forward trend and they're, they're the first people to get into that. So estate agents, for example, yeah. will get them to do a VR walkthrough of a, of a property they're trying to sell and things like that. You just have to have the imagination to see what technology can give you. And I think there's always, again, you know, with the magazine, hopefully we can kind of provide a few pointers on things like that and make people think about things they might not have thought about doing. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, obviously you're in an interesting position in that you're on issue 159 mm. or issue one, issue one. <laughs> depending yeah. on how you do your version. So let's, yeah. let's do what software companies um, would do. And this would be, I'm going to call this the first proper version of mm. the magazine, which yeah. by definition would be version four. Apparently, that was the, if you're buying software, always buy version four, nothing <laughs> earlier, because by then they've hopefully taken out the niggles. And I know a couple yeah. of software packages actually went version one and jumped straight to version four because they yes, heard this. So yes. you are that version of the magazine. Hmm. What are you doing that's going to be different to what was there in version 158 or version three or, you know, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, no, it's a good, good question. And, and, and um, I think it's really... It's really this is where it becomes interesting and and exciting and, and and scary all at the same time in that you do you have to you have to follow your intuition and um, I do want to change it um, I think obviously if you work in a as part of a bigger publishing house there's lots of people that you have to go through to do things and um, which is a good thing because it, it does kind of put a break on some of the crazier ideas you might have uh, and you also get feedback on your ideas which is always good. Um, but I, I think I now have a kind of blank canvas to do things differently in the, in the way I want to do them. And um, I think, well, we're, what I want to do is to develop the pro community particularly. I want to get lots of feedback from professionals who are out there. I want them to tell me what they want and what they want to see. Um, we're building a website, which is um, www.professionalphoto.online. Now, that's going to be live by the time issue 159 comes out. Uh, which will be towards the end of May. Um, that will also link to a YouTube channel. So again, that's, um, that's things that we haven't done before. I think it's really important to move things on. As we talked about photography being uh, silver halide and moving into digital, and it's still photography, but it's a different facet of it. I think with magazines, if you just stick, you know, if, if you use the analogy and you stuck as a, a film version of, of um a professional photo and you just never became anything other than a paper magazine um, you will eventually just just die a natural death because people want more than that and they're getting they're getting lots of information online I'm up against not just other magazines now I'm up against very strong websites and, and, and YouTube channels and things there has to be a reason why people would actually pay money to uh, to buy a professional photo and and what you want it to be is is the kind of almost like the um, the, the, you know the bible of the professional world and that you 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 meet lots of interesting people in there it's very specific um it's not aimed it's not aimed at um consumers who who want to take pictures of themselves and i have massive respect for them but we are we are a professional community so we're slightly different in that our pictures are commercial we're talking about how you take a photograph that will make you money not necessarily one you'd put on your own wall at home, but it might be something that somebody would consider they wanted to buy and pay money for. So we, we, we need to tell people about that, but I think you need to break out the straight jacket of just a, um, a paper magazine. So that will be the driver of it. That will remain the, the main platform of the magazine, but there'll be new platforms. The website, I think, will be really important because it's a portal that people can directly communicate with me and I with them. So they can, uh, they can drop me an email and they know it's going to go to the, the person who's running the business rather than, yeah. you know, uh, an editorial assistant. I mean, they, it comes straight through to me and I'll be looking, you know, and encouraging people to come to me and talk to me about ideas they have. You know, you should talk to me. I've got this idea. And, and people do that because, as I say, people like to share. They, 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 they get a buzz out of putting something out there that other people want to know about. And um, we'll be able to kind of, share things we'll be able to put links to films one of the things i want to do is is to have um for example features in the magazine that are backed up with films that are on our youtube channel and so you get more 
you have to buy the magazine to get the guts of the story because I've still got to have a commercial eye to that. But you'll get something extra as well by going on and linking into the, um, into the film that will then take you to a, another level and, and give you a bit more understanding of the story you read. And um, yeah, I, I just think it, it's going to be really interesting to try ideas out. Um, I want to run more competitions. I, I want to throw spotlights on people who are coming into the business. I'm, I'm looking at doing a, a Young Photographer of the Year competition um, to highlight people who are coming into the business, talk to some manufacturers about that. And um, yeah, just really make it a community that, that people want to dip in to be part of and you know proud to be part of and they feel it's it's their magazine and that's why people will read it because they will feel they will feel some kind of uh, empathy towards it and that it reflects what they do and 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 it's uh, it's their magazine it's I might be the one putting it out there but it's their magazine and and you know otherwise it's a vanity project <laughs> and it's uh, like a lot of work yes yeah I'm uh, yes absolutely I, I'm, I totally would go along oh, with yeah. that um but yeah, I'm, I'm on it 24-7 and, and there are other people out there I know who are similarly on the same wavelength. And what I hope to do fairly quickly is to kind of meet a few of those and, and, and to kind of, um, down the line, I'd be hoping to share some of this workload and, and, and in many ways, you know, try and get the editorial side kind of running smoothly and, and then be out there kind of meeting people like yourself, and, but like other people who are... You know, I, th I think the more face-to-face -face meetings you do, you can do so much on the phone and, and, and on, on, online and things, but to actually meet people and to sit and have ideas and share ideas and to physically see what they're doing, I think that, that's the key to it all. And, and um, <clears throat> I'll be focusing just on this magazine as opposed to doing other things as yeah. well, which obviously a bigger publishing house, you're quite a small cog in a, in a big machine. Um, with me just focusing on this, it, it's just the one thing, and uh, that will be just, uh, I'll put all my energy into that, and I think that, that's how I'll, I'll try and cope with it. When was the last time you picked up a camera to take pictures for the joy of it? Um, I do that all the time, um, and, and when, you, you know, it's defining a camera, really. Well, uh, okay, the, fair enough. Yeah, these days it, it could be it, your phone. I, mean, I, I, I often use the phone, I mean, um, you know, because you have it all the time. I'm, I'm waiting for a creative mm. category where it's yeah. the best dash cam photo yeah. ever taken, you know, because that's going to come, <laughs> just as you, you know, yeah. just yeah. just timing it, because they're all, yeah. all the, what are they now, 60 frames a second, yeah. uh, 1080p, yes. which means actually if something happens in front of you, you yeah. could get a really good quality still of it. Well, uh, we're getting news pictures now that are amazing because, you know, say, for example, um, a building's on fire in front of you and um, you, you get your phone out of your pocket, you take a yeah. picture. Uh, and this is why um, news gatherers are, are kind of desperate to talk to the public. You now get, uh, and of course it really annoys professional documentary photographers and rep reporters and things, but these are things they wouldn't be on the spot for. You, if you're a professional news photographer, you might get a phone call to say, well, there's a fire in the high street, but there's somebody going to be walking by as the fire breaks out. And it's like you could be on the spot when a, I don't know, a, a tube train breaks down and you'll walk through the tunnel or, or anything. You could be on the spot when something happens. And um, so a lot of time for smartphones, uh, which, which you, you think as an editor of a professional magazine, that's a funny thing to say. But I use that a lot. But I also, because obviously, I mean, it's my, I, I get all the latest kit comes through and, and I don't just go out and test, uh, you know, the, uh, the edge performance and, uh, you know, all the technical stuff. I'll, I'll go and shoot pictures for the for the love of it with that camera, yeah. and uh, so all the time is the answer to that. And uh, you know, I've just um, just gone through bluebell season, so I've been out with cameras, yeah. taking pictures in the local woods, and um, I don't get a huge amount of time. But uh, it's not like one of those things that you say, well, you know, it's it's the busman's holiday. You 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 spend your whole life writing a photo mag, and then at the weekend you you don't go near a camera. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there must be a lot of professional photographers who do feel like that. They just want a bit of downtime. But I've never yet come across a professional photographer who hasn't got their kind of secret stash of personal pictures that they're desperate to show. Because almost everybody, you know, they, they will say, well, yeah, well, that's, that's my professional job. But actually, look, I did this project on this lost town or something, or yeah. I did a trip across America and I, on a Harley and I took photographs on the way. And... Um, I mean, it's wonderful for magazines like us because these pictures never get seen anywhere and they will, they will love the chance to kind of share them with other people, which is why we do do projects in the magazine quite a lot. 
And it's surprising what some people do do. You know, they're a completely different style of pictures to what they do for their commercial work. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm addressing that kind of yeah. crowd. That I, think I'm unusual that. I think I'm unusual in that respect in that actually mm. my, what I shoot here for clients mm. is what I've always loved shooting. Yes. Because I entered the industry that way. I got pulled mm. in. So I don't do typically off the wall. No. I think I'm probably a bit unusual in that regard. i tell you one thing I did do the other day. I was shooting in a bluebell wood not far from you. I was down in Herne Bay, oh, down right. in Kent. Yeah. Uh, and my brief was to make sure no bluebells appeared in there whatsoever. Oh, because I was shooting it. for a summer yes. campaign. Yes, of course. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, exactly, it was cold yeah. and we had to get the poor lady to take her coat off and look warm. Yes, and I had to make sure yes. no bluebells got into the shop. No. <laughs> How annoying is that? It's, it was yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, did. I keep trying to persuade people, if they want to do summer shoots, take me somewhere warm. <laughs> if they want to do winter shoots, take me somewhere cold, you know. But yes, no, we're always yeah. trying to dance around the budgets. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's the way. But I mean, that's what makes you a professional photographer, isn't it? In that you, you're aware of that. And, and, and not only that, you can, you can make it happen. You know, that, that's the brief. And it is, it's about, you know, hitting the brief, but hitting... And there, there's, there's this massive cliche, which is like exceed expectations. And... And I don't like trotting cliches out because they're so easy. But that's that's the art to it. It's not yeah. rocket science. If you surprise people, yeah. If you if you they, they expect something because you're a professional yeah. and they know they're going to get something that's going to be a professional image. But if you give them something that's they go wow, yeah. you know that's actually I can't believe you did that. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the key to it. And then that's that's what sets you apart. You've um, obviously seen the demise of an awful lot of magazines and you've spoken a little bit about it today mm. and we all know that the um, paper publishing industries themselves have had a fairly tough time, I think, mm. over the past few years. And you're obviously, you're bucking the trend, you've got a, a, a magazine that's long lived and you're now taking it through to its next generation. What do you think has been the biggest mistake that magazine publishers have made and what do you think photographers can learn from that? Um, it's, it's difficult. I think you have to have the right people working on it. People who are, are not just jobbing journalists, but who, who are genuinely interested in what they're writing about. And I think sometimes, I suppose, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I suppose sometimes it is possible that someone's a professional journalist and they can work on a magazine for, you know, it, it could be about, you know, um, property one minute and it could be about kitchen design another minute and then photography the next. And they're very good at um, putting a professional piece of copy together, but unless you've really got the interest, and you've got to understand your audience, I think that's really important. And um, But if you're talking about paper magazines as well, I think the thing is you, you always constantly have to be looking at ways to evolve that and um, change it, because absolutely nothing in this world stays the same. This is, um, I mean, reporting on photography, that's, that's you know, that, that's absolutely... That's the lesson you can't help but, but learn. I mean, if, if um, you know, we talk about the analogy of, you know, what, what kit were we reviewing when we started up professional photo 13 years ago? And it would be medium format uh, film cameras and, and um, everything would have been film based and the new Velvias and, and, yeah. and silver halide and everything else. Now, if you just stuck with that and never moved on and said, well, you know, that actually did really well. You know, our first few issues flew off the shelves and, and it was... It was immediately very popular, but if you said, "Well, that's popular, so we'll just stick with that formula. We're never moving on." Everything changed. Everything changes, and, and the business we uh, we were focusing on changed, so we had to reflect that. And I think that completely that has to never stop. You have to completely be evolving all the time. And I think sometimes, if you're a big publishing house, it's very difficult to have that individual attention on every title you're putting out there. So I suppose that again would be something that potentially could be seen as a, an issue, I suppose, with, with some of the magazines that perhaps are no longer with us. Um, also, they're very, very congested areas. Yeah. And I think um, there were so many magazines aimed at consumers and, and, and people who love taking pictures for the sheer love of it. Um, and, and so the competition there is so fierce. And, and with big publishing houses as well, they've all got budgets and they're all kind of going hammer and tong. And there are going to be casualties, um, particularly as, um, as we mentioned earlier on, there's so much information online that if, you're, if you've got a casual interest in photography where you might have bought a photo magazine once to, uh, to help you improve and to get better, um, these days you might get that information just from going on a website or, or, or so you, browsing. So I think with ourselves, we're, we're fortunate. We, we had 
quite a lot of professional rivals on the high street at one point because there was a market for it. People were buying magazines more then than they do now. We, um, we are pretty much the only one now that is out on the high street, which is looking at the business of, of photography, professional photography, which is good because that gives us, um, obviously, that gives us a, a kind of genre to, to explore, which is very, very different to the consumer yes. genre. Um, and um, we have an awful lot of people as well. I think these days as well, um, people aren't satisfied to do a job that's boring. And there was a time where just the actual fact you had a job would be, that was what it was all about. And, and you know, uh, you weren't, there were no expectations of doing anything other than working till you're 65 and then hanging your boots up and, and that was it. And um, I think people want more out of life now. And um, that's why the creative industries are so, so popular because people want to do something. Uh, to do a creative job is amazing because you do something and there's something of you in it. And, and, and um, that's what I love about magazine publishing is that every month you get something in your hands that you created yeah. and um, for better or worse, and you yeah. can be happy with an issue or, or less happy with another one. But it, it's still a creative business. It's not a nine to five. It's not a kind of, there's no formula for it. And, um, but so many people want to do a creative business. And you look at how many people are now trying to qualify to do a creative job, whether that's photography or filmmaking. And um, so we're tapping into that. I mean, that's one of the things I think will, will help us moving forward is that we have a lot of aspirational professional photographers who read us alongside the, um, the existing professional photographers. And, uh, and I really welcome that because um, the more people we can kind of help to introduce into the business, which is, like I say, it's amazing business. You can understand why so many people want to be involved in it yeah. because it's a wonderful thing to be involved in. Um, you know, you, you get, you're not in an office all the time, you're getting out, you're meeting people, you have the thrill of creating something, you, you get the response of the person that you're selling to, which can be incredible. You know, they can burst into tears with emotion and things. Uh, you, you are, you're doing a really important and a really worthwhile and a really exciting and interesting job. And, and, and I think if we reflect that and, and, and tell people about it and, and share that information and give them something that they can't get necessarily wholly online, because I think, you know, if we create a community, there, there's very few platforms that have, have got websites and films and, and a paper magazine. We're, we're, we're pretty much unique in that respect. So, but I, I'd say the thing is that we have to constantly evolve. And I think much as you wouldn't go on a, a photography course these days and just do nothing but study photography. Um, photography has moved beyond that. You have to acquire new skills. This is why we're covering filmmaking. Not the huge way, but as a kind of facet of, of what you need to do. Um, yeah, that's, um, we have to reflect that. We have to tell people about it. We have to say, this is why you should do it. And this is how you can do it. So we talk to people, we put examples up there of people who've done it. And, and it's, it's us moving forward all the time and, and just reflecting the real world that's going on out there and um, just telling people about it really. Brilliant. Uh, still staying on the topic of um, printed media, obviously, mm. that means I know as a digital photographer, like we all are, yes. I still have a passion for uh, picking up a book and a magazine. Yes. Um, what is, so I'll, to qualify this, yeah. I'm building a library here of yeah. all, of, all of the people I've interviewed, their mm -hmm. favourite books, because of course they tell me their books, you can get these things second hand. You know, I, I bought one the other day and the shipping cost me more than the book. <laughs> Yes. Which because second hand yes. books have, at the moment there's not a huge market value, which is wonderful if you like yeah. me like books. So tell me your favourite photographic book or photography book. I've got lots of favourites, but the one I'd, I'd pick out because it was when I was um, when I was at school and, and, and trying to well getting enthused about photography for the first time. This is one of the books in the library at school that, that I picked up and I thought, you know what, this is wonderful. I'd love to be able to take pictures like that. And I have to say, I never have been able to take pictures like that. But it was the uh, Elliot Erwitt, er, Erwitt, Elliot Erwitt dog book, and it is just called Dogs. And uh, he has such a, an affectionate eye. Um, candid pictures and, and, and just the way he kind of sees things that are amusing and funny, but very clever. I mean, it's not, it's not something that uh, everybody can do, but he, has, he puts a sense of humor through his photographs, and, and I love that. And um, one of the real thrills was years later, that, that kind of encouraged me to, they want to take photography more seriously and I went and I studied and I 
got my degree and everything, and then but moved into magazines. And then, so years later, I, I had the opportunity when he came to London as part of my job on the magazine to go and interview him, which was fantastic to, I mean, that is one of the massive privileges of the job is, is to have a reason to go and sit one-to-one yeah. -one with, yeah. with somebody yeah, like that. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think I'm doing? Yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, it, well, absolutely. I'm doing it. I'm sitting into interviewing interesting people. Yeah. It's brilliant. But to sit there and, and give your personal questions to this, and, and I would say probably everybody knows his pictures, but not everybody knows his name. And, and you'd say to somebody, oh, I met earlier Irwitt today. And they'd say, well, I've never heard of him. But you show them the pictures. Oh, well, yeah, of course I saw, you know, with yeah. the massive dog and yeah. the small dog. Yeah, I've seen that. And, um, but yeah, I mean, for me, it was like being a rock star, I suppose. Yeah. And, and that uh, you get to sit with him and he was nice. And they say, don't meet your heroes. He was actually very nice, very pleasant. Gave me time, you know, I was quite young at the time and he didn't kind of talk down to me at all. And, and it was great. And, and that really is one of the privileges of the job. But then you put that into the story and then you say, yes, you know, I've, uh, I met him. And, and, and other people meet him through you in a way, yeah. you know, in that you have to get the essence of that into the words. And, but uh, the words were there because I understood the man, if that makes sense, because I, I love photography and, and I loved his work. Uh, you, you then write a better story than someone perhaps who was a professional writer who just went along to interview someone they didn't really know and uh, it was just another job. Uh, it was a lot more than just another job and yeah lots of lots of interviews like that since with, with people I you know were complete heroes and heroines to me but um, yeah that was that was the first and that's the book I'd definitely nominate I think. Perfect it'll be an amazing addition to the library. Uh, I will go on to um, Tinterweb and go and find myself a second-hand copy now. Uh, I'll put the details to that in the footnotes. And then one final question. Of course, this is issue one for you. It's your baby. Mm, uh, yes. When can people expect to be able to buy the magazine? Uh, that will be out probably towards the end of May. I'd say um, about the third week of May. We come out about the third week of each, each month. Okay. And uh, we come out every four weeks, so that does slightly change. But yes, that, that's when the first issue of mine as publisher will be perfect uh, and at this stage it's UK only UK only at the moment but there is a digital edition which you'll if anybody does need to get hold of that they'll be able to do it through that website perfect I'll publish all of the details of that on there of course for our American friends uh, that will be the way for them to get hold of it at this stage yes we have quite uh, quite a considerable American audience that is reading the yeah. digital magazine and, and um, yes they get that at the same time as it comes on sale in the shops here and it's just a page turner, so it's basically the digital yeah. version and, and cheaper than buying the paper version. Oh, you can't say that. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, if, if you're in America. Well, actually, at the moment, we have more American listeners than we do UK listeners, so hopefully you get plenty of people subscribing to your magazine from over there. Yes. And on that happy note, Terry Hope, it has been an absolute privilege to sit here and spend an hour chatting with you. In fact, we spent a couple of hours because, of course, <laughs> we spent a couple of hours chatting before we started chatting. We did, uh, yes. It's I... an absolute joy to meet you. Uh, I'm very privileged to be uh, involved with your magazine a little bit around the edges. And we're delighted to have you as well. Thank you. Thank I you. wish you the best of luck. The industry needs people like you and people like your magazine, and I cannot wait to see it succeed. Thank you very much for your time, energy, and candour. Thank pleasure. you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, and I'm not one to say I told you so, but didn't I tell you so? Terry Hope, such a nice guy, such an interesting guy. Uh, so many stories. We could have talked for hours and hours. In fact, we did talk for hours and hours, uh, but I only recorded a one hour segment of that. Please do go and look up uh, the magazine. I will put the website details in the footnotes below. Uh, if you're in the UK, of course, uh, you should go and buy a printed copy because there is still nothing quite like picking up a magazine and seeing prints uh, on paper. They just There's just something about it. I just think it's really lovely. Uh, tons of interesting articles. Of course, one of those is ours. I'm really honoured uh, to be a small part of the magazine over the coming year. Uh, all about lighting from us, uh, but there's a whole heap of really, really interesting content. And keep an eye on it and see how it evolves. I'm sure Terry, uh, while it started looking the way it is, I'm sure by the time we get to the end of this first year, it will look and feel uh, even even more beautiful because I know Terry's idea is to keep it evolving, keep it pushing forward, uh, and to keep it being the exciting uh, magazine he's always intended it to be. So please go and do that. Uh, of course, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please, 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 Please do leave us a review, leave us a rating. 
Uh, you can do that on iTunes. Uh, you can do that on Podbean. You can do that on Stitcher. You can do that on Radio Public. Uh, you can do that on Spotify. Uh, we are on all of those channels, and I'm pretty certain we're on quite a few more besides because of the very nature of the way that podcasts are distributed by their XML feeds. Uh, please do uh, tell other people about the podcast. Uh, we put quite a lot of effort into finding people. You should see the interviewer, sorry, the interviewee list I have in my intro. It's going to be uh, a real, a really, really, hopefully interesting mix of. Uh, I've got there's a, a world famous architect in there. Uh, there's our local gym uh, entrepreneur uh, built this beautiful boutique gym. He's an ex professional footballer. There are more photographers, of course. There are more photographers uh, on the list because they're always it's always interesting to hear what other photographers have to say but I'm trying to mix it up and I'm trying to talk to people that have genuinely interesting stories uh, but have ideas and experiences that might just might just be useful to us as portrait photographers if there's anyone you can think of you'd like us to have an interview with then please do drop us an email i can be reached at paul at paul wilkinson photography.co.uk that's paul at paul wilkinson photography.co.uk and don't worry if you're thinking oh, you know <laughs> paul he's, he's a photographer never get back is i have people keeping an eye on that email address so that uh, yes if that something comes in i do try and make sure uh, that it's dealt with but if you have great ideas for someone who'd like to be interviewed or indeed if you'd like to be interviewed uh, if you have a story to tell if you have ideas that might just be uh, worth sharing with the photography community the in particular the portrait photography or, or social photography really we've called the podcast uh, mastering portrait photography simply because that was the title of the book and that's now the title of our website uh, but of, of course like most social photographers i do a bit of wedding work i do portrait work and i do an awful lot of commercial portraiture as well uh, some interesting bookings uh, coming down the pike uh, on that front uh, so anyway remember it's late at night have a wonderful bank holiday weekend if, if you're listening to this uh, before the bank holiday monday uh, and whatever happens remember be kind to yourself take care